Um, hello again. This time I'm going to attempt to prove the centripetal force equation. F equals mv squared over r. This is basically saying an object moving in a circle will experience a force that is equal to its mass times its velocity squared, so we can say it's speed in the given direction squared, divided by the radius of the circle. Um, I'm going to prove this uh, using some algebra, but I'm not going to use. I'm not going to go far in the way of vectors. I think. I think the correct and more um, vigorous proof would be to use vectors. But I'm not going to go into the. Uh, I'm not going to delve into vectors because they're more complicated and it. You need to get your head around them. So I'm going to stick with. Uh, I'm not going to go into vectors. I'll start by drawing a diagram. Um, v1 is the velocity of the particle at a particular point and V2 is the velocity of, of the particle a little bit later. Now uh, the speeds of, at, of the particle um, of, at, at both points are the same. So the velocities are different but the only reason the velocities are different is because their directions are different. So the speed of the, um, of the particle is still the same at both. So the only acceleration that is, the, the acceleration is caused purely by a change in direction. Right, okay. So what I've done is I resolved the velocity of the particle at the second point into its two components, into two components, vertical and horizontal. Um, so we can see that we can see that this can, we can resolve it into v2 sine theta and v2 cos theta. You can you can use previews in geometry that the two thetas um, are going to be identical to each other. So all I've done is simply um, resolves the, 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 the V2 velocity into its two constituent components um, horizontally and vertically. Right. Okay. So what I've done is I've said that acceleration is going to be a change in velocity over the change in time. So that's fairly simple. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the vertical components of both the first position and the second position um, of the particle um, with their respective velocities and I'm going to work out what the change in velocity is so resolving, ho resolving vertically at this point you might want to refer back to the diagram by rewinding um, we can say that the change in velocity is equal to v cos theta which is the n velocity uh, n vertical velocity of the second position so that's going to be v, um, v cos theta and the first one since the f at the first point all the velocity is going in the vertical direction that's just v so change of velocity is going to be v cos theta minus v and I haven't put the subscripts on because the speed of v is the same as at v1 and v2 the only thing that changes is the direction that's all that changes in terms of the velocity okay right um, so obviously we can derive an acceleration simply by dividing the equation to by a change in time. So we've got the acceleration um, from the result, um, the, the acceleration in the vertical direction is equal to v cos theta minus v over delta t. Right. Uh, we also have the horizontal direction that we need to consider first um, before we do anything else. So same principle. The end velocity to so the velocity at a, a point at the second point is going to be v sine theta um, from the diagram earlier I showed you at the first point there isn't actually a horizontal velocity because all the velocity is moving in the vertical direction so in fact the change in velocity is simply v sine theta which means the um, acceleration is very simply v sine theta over delta t um, okay Okay, next what I'm going to do is some small angle approximations. Um, now the idea behind this is that the acceleration is changing constantly. So what we want is an instantaneous change in acceleration. So actually, we say that acceleration is change in velocity over change in time. But we want the change in time to be very, very, very small. And also we want the change in velocity to be very, very, very small. So because since the acceleration is changing over time, we want to know the instant ex ex um, acceleration at any given point. So we're going to have to make these changes very small in order that we can get a best approximation. And in fact, these uh, um, delta V and delta T should tend towards zero. So what we're going to do is some angle approximations for very small values of delta theta of theta and delta t. Our, the our theta is exactly the same because since um, delta t is, is, is close to zero and so is theta. 
So I've drawn this triangle where, where we're going to assume that theta is very close to zero. Right. Now, the approximation we're going to use is of sine theta. Now, we know that sine theta is from, some, from basic trigonometry is equal to a over b. Now, since theta is very, very, very small, we can say that, that it's equal to that this is approximately equal to a over r because r and b we're going to say are, are pretty much the same because theta is so small and theta is nearly zero. So, so we can say a over b is approximately equal to a over r. Now, if you imagine that instead of a triangle, we actually have a sector of a circle, um, and the arc of the circle is given by is given by s. We can do a further approximation. We can say that a over r is, is approximately equal to s over r. And this holds because um, the, the curvature of the circle, because the circle, if I drew the full circle, it would be so big that it's effectively exactly the same. So we can say a over r is effectively the same as s over r. But we know from basic circle, um, we know from circle theorems that s is equal to r theta. So we can, so we can um, substitute r theta into that equation. So, so s over r goes to r theta over r. And the r's cancel out, and so we're left with theta. So for very small angles, sine of theta is approximately equal to theta. Um, now, with cos, now with cos theta, um, it's the, the logic is actually much simpler. And what we've got is that cos theta is equal to r over b. Again, basic trigonometry. But we know that r and b are, are, are pretty much identical because theta is so small. So we can say r over b is approximately b over b, which is of course 1. In fact, in fact, I should have put b over b equals 1, obviously. Uh, so that's a, a little mistake there. But it's very simple. All we're going to do is simply substitute these angle approximations into the resolved vertical and horizontal accelerations that I've already worked out. So, well, I've already worked out that for the vertical acceleration, a is equal to b sine theta over delta t. Now we know that sine theta is equal to theta because theta is very small. So we can say that that's approximately equal to v theta over delta t. I've got to do the same with um, the horizontal acceleration. So again, with the horizontal acceleration, we prove that a equals v minus v cos theta over delta t. Now we know that cos theta is going to be equal to one. So that so that goes to v minus v over delta theta, and v minus v is naught, and naught over anything is naught. So we actually see that uh, the, the horizontal acceleration in this case is actually zero. So we can ignore the horizontal acceleration. So the only, the only, can, the only acceleration is vertical in this case. So we can say that A is V theta over delta T. And we know that theta over T is equal to omega because omega is the angular, angular velocity. And we know that a given revolution in terms of an angle, theta, over time is going to be an angular velocity. So we know that theta over t is going to be omega. So we therefore we can say that a is equal to the omega. Now, we know that angular velocity, omega, is equal to v over r. So again, that's, that's um, basic, um, basic um, um, centripetal equation. Um, so, since omega is equal to v over r, we can substitute that. We can substitute the value for omega into the above equation. So we can get a is actually equal to v squared over r. So now we have the centripetal acceleration. The last step is very simple. All we use is Newton's second law, f equals ma. So therefore, um, we times the v squared over r by um, m to get the equation for the centripetal force in a circle, f equals mv squared over r. Um, I hope that was helpful. Um, I might do an, another version um, which is more mathematically sound using vectors. Um, but I hope, I hope that provides a little bit of insight. And as, and as always, if I made a mistake, please don't hesitate to correct me.